Hello, about this Tim here, finally back again <laughs> with the To Beat It All, a franchise re review, uh, basically a re review. Just to give, I just decided to go back and watch the Nightmare on Elm Street films again to see if my thoughts on them had have, have changed since the last time I reviewed them, which which was a pretty good while ago, or a decent amount of time ago. So just to jump into this re review here. It's just a re-review is just something where I just want to do these little videos, short videos, where kind of like, more like mini reviews for the movies I've already reviewed, <clears throat> just to go back and see if my mind has changed on them uh, after a certain amount of time, after uh, I haven't seen them in a while. See if, you know, I got a new perspective on them after a while. Let's see. So, we've, um, basically we've got Nightmare on Earth Street 1. Pretty much for me, for the first one, and as you can see, the second, third, and fourth one. This four pack, which is they're both they've got two discs and they're double sided. Uh, I hate double sided discs. I can't stand that. But um, anyway, that's besides the point. Jump into the first film. I still feel the same way about the first one as I did before in my old review. Um, watching it again, it's still a great movie. I love it. Definitely a, a slasher movie, horror classic, and one of Wes Craven's best films, if not the best. Um, and now Runner Street Two. Uh, my opinion on it has actually changed. Um, to be honest. Uh, last time I reviewed the movie, I gave it two stars. Said I, at least, I said I liked the movie. Um, I still like the movie. As a matter of fact, I like it a little bit more. This time, since the movie is so different from the first movie and doesn't really try to emulate the first movie at all, I decided to watch this movie more of the, more as its own thing, which I think is the way to watch it. This is a like self-contained Freddy story and not a movie that's trying to build upon the first movie or anything like that. So I decided to watch it like that instead of... Uh, Comparing it to the first movie. The only time I compared it to the first movie is at certain times when I felt like it needed to be. Uh, as far as the film goes, I found it more entertaining this time. I liked the movie. I, I would give it, I would give it two and a half stars this time instead of two, instead of two stars. Uh, I still don't think it's a great movie. I think I do think it's a decent movie. I actually was really enjoying like the, uh, like um, the final of the movie. <clears throat> Um, when Freddy, like, his body burn up and everything is a cool special effect. And Jesse came out of Freddy's body instead of the other way around. Um, and I thought that was really cool. But what really, what still really hurts this movie is the ending. It's a really lame ending because it's really expected. And you can see it, see it coming a mile away. Um, and for any, I know everybody's already seen this, but I'm going to say it anyway. At the end of the movie, Jesse's back on the, uh, the bus again from the beginning of the movie. And he has another bus nightmare again. Uh, with with uh, Freddy's arm popping out of some girl's chest that's sitting behind him in the back the in the seat behind him, um, that's a really lame ending. Um, that really hurts the movie. And if I, even if I wanted to give it four stars, that would at least have to knock it down to two and a half. Because that ending is just that's just bad. Um, but I still I still don't think the film's a great movie. Um, but I at least think it's a decent movie. It's an enjoyable movie. It's a decent movie. And it is one of the better one of the it's it's pretty much one of the it's pretty much the middle of the road movie of the franchise. Not bad, not good, just decent. Um, as far as it go, but I still I still like the movie, and I do think I do think it's underrated. But um, I do think some of the some of the fans who really love this one and speak about how underrated it is, I think they actually overrate it some. In my honest opinion, I mean, if you love the movie, that's fine. But in my honest opinion, I think people who really love Part 2, I think they do overrate it slightly. I still don't think it's a great movie, but I do think it's a decent movie. I do think it's enjoyable, and I can actually I can actually pretty much see why people, some, I mean, why people uh, would really like the movie, because it is different. Maybe people didn't like the style of the first Nightmare on Elm Street. Maybe they just prefer this one. Hell, I don't know. Um, <laughs> but for me, it's just a decent movie. I still think it's enjoyable, though, and I think Mark Patton gives a good performance. Uh, as far as, and I really like Robert Ressler in the movie, too. Uh, as far as it goes for the third movie, Dream Warriors, my mind hasn't changed any on it. I still, it's still a great movie, a very enjoyable movie, really good movie. Um, Not Runner Street 4, The Dream Master. I gave it, actually, two and a half stars, uh, in my last review, because... Even though I did say it was my favorite sequel, and it still is, but I gave it two and a half stars. And watching it again, I think I was too harsh on it. I would honestly give this movie three stars now after watch, watching it again. My definitive definitive like opinion on this movie, I would give it three stars. I find it a very enjoyable movie. Not as good as part three, but it doesn't try to be like part three. This movie goes for the MTV over-the-top style Freddy Krueger movie with Freddy being the hero. And when I watched it the last time, 
I was kind of in the the zone. Like I don't want to see Freddy the Hero. I want him to be you know the villain. That that made me like the movie less. But now embracing the movie more and seeing it for what it is with Freddy being the superstar, obviously at this time, I think the movie. Well, it's, while it's not scary, it's not scary. It's not. But it's entertaining as shit. This is a very entertaining movie and a lot of fun. And one of Robert England's <clears throat> best performances as Freddy is in this movie. Just because he looks like he's having so much fun. Um, but then again, he looks like he's having a blast in Freddy's Dead as well. But that movie sucks so bad it's unbelievable. But let's Okay, as for part five, my opinion is still the same on part five. I think it's a, a two-star film, a passable movie. Or an okay movie, I mean. I think it's an okay movie. Part five is just an okay movie. My opinion on that is still the same. Um, you can take or leave part five pretty much. You don't have to see it, but if you like the character from part four, Alice, like I did, I can see why you'd want to see what she does next in part five. So if you enjoy the series up to one through four, uh, fuck it, why not see five? Uh, as far as part six goes, my opinion has changed on this one. When I last saw part six, I tried to be nice to the movie because I knew it was like just like a comedy and it was trying to be a comedy, but, and I gave it like a passable two stars. But after watching the film again after so long, I would honestly give it one and a half. I find this film is such a disgrace um, to the character of Freddy. It's not. It's just an insult. It's like they're not even trying to make a Freddy movie by this point. They just, I understand they just want to go out with a bang and just have a blast. But you could have done that. But not making the comedy so over the top and, re and silly. And it's just in your face comedy. It's like right in your face. Like, Freddy even looking back at the audience and telling them to shh, be quiet and shit like he's breaking the fourth wall. That's just too much. It's just just too much. They, they just overdid the comedy to the 29th degree here. And when Roseanne and Tom Arnold show up, it just gets embarrassing. And I'll admit the film is funny as shit, but it just is not a Nightmare on Elm Street movie. It's just a comedy with Freddy in it. It's like Freddy walked on the set of a Nightmare on Elm Street parody movie. Um, I still would give it a passable two stars, but the final line in the movie is what really kills me. They they finally killed Freddy after all these movies, and then in a really cheesy scene with Yafit Kodo and um, whatever the girl's name was that played Tracy. I forgot her name, even though I didn't really mind her too much. I thought she was annoying, but I thought the actor or actress did at least a decent job acting-wise. But uh, Leslie Dean, I think is her name, but... um. Her and Yafit Koto are like sitting there, and they're just waiting for Lisa Zane to, de to deliver her last line of the movie, or the final line of the movie, and she's like, Freddy's dead, and I'm like, how fucking cheesy can you get? Um, that right there just, that made me hate the movie even more. I would give it one star and a half, honest, honestly, one star and a half movie. <sighs> Such a sad way for the character to go out in the mainstream continuity of the films. Such a sad way. <laughs> um... I mean, for it to be supposedly the final death of Freddy, which it was. And when I watched, when I watched it again, I kept thinking this was supposed to be the last movie. Um, or at least, I guess, the studio wanted it to be the last one, which is probably bullshit. But still, they made it seem like they wanted it to be. So, this was supposed to be Freddy's final hurrah. It sure went out on a cheesier than hell note. Like It made the character of Freddy into almost a joke. He was almost like a goofy grandpa or something that... <laughs> That you laugh at or something. You're not laughing with Freddy in this movie. You're laughing at Freddy is the problem. Um, even though Robin English's performance, even though he's playing a complete joke of a version of Freddy, he's funnier and shit. His lines are hilarious, but the way they do the character is just horrible. The way they rep have him represented in the Freddy's Dead is horrible. Um, well, New Nightmare. My opinion has changed on this movie. Once again, this is another one where my opinion has changed. For New Nightmare, uh, I believe last time I gave it um, three stars. This time, I would honestly, I would give it three and a half. I enjoyed it more this time. Uh, I think I honestly had to stick up my ass last time I reviewed this movie because I kept thinking, well, this isn't my Freddy, you know. Um, even though I, I recognize the film is enjoyable and it's good, this isn't my Freddy, you know. Where's the Elm Street and all that shit? But watching it now, I see it more as what it really is. A film on its own, not really connected to the other Freddy movies. I mean, in a way it is, at least to the first one. But at the same time, no. And even if you do consider it connected to the other Freddy movies, I consider watching this one with an open mind and seeing it for what it is instead of an actual sequel. And so therefore, I enjoyed this movie a lot more watching it like that. I mean, I still enjoyed it a lot last time, but I did enjoy it more this time watching it. I would give it three and a half. In my opinion, it's the third best movie in the series after part three. Even though four is my favorite sequel, I still think part uh, three and New Nightmare are both better than part four. 
Um, uh, part one, I think, is the best, followed by Dream Warriors and then uh, New Nightmare. Those are the top three, in my opinion. And then after that, I would say uh, Dream Master, which is my favorite sequel, but I would say it's fourth best. Um, Dream Child, I'm uh, no, not Dream Child, but Freddy's Revenge would be fifth. Uh, Dream Child would be sixth. And then uh, Freddy's Dead would be right there scraping the bottom barrel. Oh, and if you count Freddy vs. Jason, if you want me, my opinion on that is still pretty much the same. I think it's a good movie. It's enjoyable just to watch the two fight, but it could have been a lot better. And at least a, and it, I, at least if they would have had Kane Hodder in the movie, that would have elevated the movie right there by itself. But sadly, we didn't get that. And so pretty much my opinion on that movie is still the same. And all in all, oh, oh my god, I almost forgot the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. I almost forgot that movie even existed in this franchise. As far as that film goes, I hate that movie. I hate that movie worse than Freddy's Dead. Robert England at least gave a, a funny, good, humorous performance in Freddy's Dead. He was at least funny. It's just the stuff they had him do, the comedy stuff they had him do was horrible. Uh, but at least he was funny, as always. But the remake, God, man, it is the one of the, is the worst horror remake I've ever seen. Only because I'm such a super fan of the Nightmare on Elm Street films as, as a horror franchise. It's just horrible. Horrible. Don't see it. <laughs> Don't even bother watching it. If you haven't seen it yet, which I'd say pretty much everybody's seen it already. But if you haven't seen it, stay away. As, as far as you can stay. It is atrocious. But that's pretty much it for my franchise re-review here of these films. Um, and just to jump into something a little extra here. I've actually recently bought the Stargate box sets for the TV show. The movie I actually don't mind too much, but I'm not going to get into it. I'm just going to focus on the TV show here. Decided to uh, do a review for the TV show since I bought every single season of SG-1. Um, so I figured, you know, shit, why not give it a shot here. Um... You got Michael, you got Amanda Tapping, who is very cute in this series, and gets even cuter as it goes along, actually. Richard Dean Anderson, uh, Richard Dean Anderson, Anderson from MacGyver, who actually uh, is funnier than shit, pretty much, in most of these episodes, or at least has really great humorous lines. And you get full frontal nudity in the first episode, because I believe the first season was on Showtime, and not on Sci-Fi Channel, so they had less restrictions, so that's pretty nice. Uh, Michael Shanks. Um, as Dr. Uh, Daniel Jackson, uh, Jackson, he does a, a great uh, impression of James Spader from the movie. <laughs> Later on in the series, he starts to lose that a little, but every now and then he starts to bring it back. But he becomes more of his own person later on in the series. But for the first like, couple episodes, or at least the first season, he's really bringing that James Spader-ness. Uh, Christopher Judge is Tilk. Uh, he's great. He's fine. Cool character. Enjoyable to watch. Um, that's the first season. A lot of fun. Break into season two. Pretty much the same similar type box. Only this time we have the inclusion of the Asgards. Uh, which I thought it was cool how they brought in the Asgards in this show. As aliens. And they had it, they had Thor as like a... They had Thor as like the main one who became, I guess you could say, buddies with O'Neill in the series. Uh, MacGyver. <laughs> As he's better known as Richard Dean Anderson, who plays uh, Jack O'Neill. Um, one thing about Jack O'Neill, though, is that I would have preferred the uh, more serious Jack O'Neill from the uh, movie. But um, the one we get in the TV series with the jokes and stuff, um, he's he works for the TV series. But I prefer the version from the movie. And as cool as Richard Dean Anderson is, Kurt Russell is, is cooler. Uh, but Richard Dean Anderson uh, does his best job. I mean... That he could, I, I'm assuming. He does great in the series. I mean, he's probably, he's my favorite character of the television series, but I do prefer Kurt Russell. Um, just jump into the... Where's that here? Season 3, different style box. Uh, by the time the show gets into Season 3, it's really starting to like take off. You get a lot of fun action and stuff like that. I haven't watched the special features on most of these season sets. Um, oh, the guy who plays General Hammond... Uh, I forgot the actor's name, but he's in most of the seasons. I believe he's passed away now, which is sad. But the guy who plays General Hammond in this show, he is great, man. <laughs> I mean, I told, for the character he's playing, a military like leader, general, whatever, um, the guy who runs the Stargate program, he does. he's perfect. He's fine. Totally believable. Um, season 4, once again, a, a similar box. 
I think it's cool. I believe uh, this season is the one that brings in these things, which are the things that Daniel uh, learns to communicate with, or Michael Shanks, I mean, does, which I think is neat, and that they come back uh, in other seasons. I think it's cool how he starts to communicate with them and learns to speak their language and shit and basically becomes a member of the tribe. That's a lot of fun. Jump into season five. Well, as far as it goes for season five, we got Apophis in this season as well. By the time we get to season five, I was hoping God that Apophis would, would finally die. I, I, I gotta admit, once we got to season five, I enjoyed Apophis when, I, when he was first in the show, but by, when he kept dying and coming back over and over, by the time we got to season five, I was sick to death of Apophis. Thank God his character finally died. <laughs> we jump into season six. This is when Cord and Namek showed up in the series as uh, Jonas, I believe his character's name was, to replace uh, Michael Shanks, who they killed off, because I believe he wanted to leave the show because he felt like his character just didn't really have any motivation in the show anymore and didn't want... I don't know. I've heard that he might have got too prideful and wanted more to do or something like that or more than the other actors, and he said, fuck it, I'm out. Um... <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not. Um, but you get a Corrin and Mac in this, which I enjoy seeing his character in this. He's all right. They don't try to make him like Daniel Jackson's character. He's a guy who's trying to fill the spot that Daniel Jackson left in the, the group because he views himself as partially responsible for the death of Daniel Jackson, I, I'm assuming. Or he just blames himself partially for it in a way because he was experimenting with, some, with a bomb. Um... That uh, the experiment just fucked up and caused Daniel Jackson to get radiation and he basically killed him off. But you get all this, this is when you start getting more into like this ex extended being stuff and all that kind of stuff. And that shit becomes kind of confusing and kind of hurts the series a little bit. And becomes a little annoying because the ascended beings are all fucking sorry and shit and don't want to help humanity at all. So basically if you become an ascended being, all you do is sit on your ass I love, what makes me laugh, though, in the series is, like, they always try to act like, the ascended beings are so much more intelligent than human beings, they're on such a higher level playing field, I'm like, all they do is sit on their ass, they have all the knowledge in the world, and they can't use anything, they might as well be a fucking robot, but anyway, we jump into season seven. Oh, but another thing I wanted to mention, uh, the character of Jonas, Corn to make. I enjoyed his character. He didn't try to be like uh, Daniel Jackson. He just, well, he tried to fill that that character spot, but he wasn't just a carbon copy of him. But I do admit, I did miss Daniel Jackson, but I didn't mind the character of Jonas. But Daniel Jackson would have been better. And the ending of season six, where the like Abydos, the whole planet gets destroyed, and they all become everybody there is dead, and they have they, they become ascended beings as well. That's a great ending, um, and it's really epic. Uh, and also sad for anybody that loves the TV series who started with the movie because, of course, that's, you know, the first planet we saw in the first movie and everything's been fucking annihilated on it by a uh, system lord uh, he, uh, by the name of Anubis. So that was pretty epic ending, especially when you saw the explosion and, the, like, the pyramid shit all blew up there. That was pretty cool. Um, as far as Season 7 goes, it's pretty nice. Sorry about that little jump cut right there. <laughs> I had to jump and do something real quick. But anyway, back to what I was saying about Stargate. Um, you got season seven here, which uh, is, a, is, a, is a nice season. Very is enjoy, It's enjoyable. Uh, but you got Daniel Jackson coming back. The way they bring him back, though, I, I, I do think is... I mean, when they bring him back, though, it hurts the character of, of Jonas and makes him feel just like he was a Daniel Jackson, you know, mini... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say replacement, but I mean, just like a... I don't know how to say it. Just like a, a, a Daniel Jackson holdover character just to kill time until Daniel Jackson comes back. And that's what hurts the character of Jonas. It makes him seem like he's overall just kind of useless to the franchise. But I enjoyed Corn the Mech in Season 6. But because they when they bring Daniel Jackson back, they just kind of get rid of Corn the Mech's character. And that just kind of makes him seem like Daniel Jackson light <laughs> in the franchise. Because it makes him just seem like a time killer or time waster until Daniel Jackson comes back. But anyway, season seven <clears throat> is, an, is an enjoyable season. But at this point, though, I'm kind of getting bored with the whole, like, Amanda Tapping and uh, Love Affair with Richard Dean Anderson. 
or Anderson because it just doesn't really go anywhere because they never really get together. I mean, they keep. I mean, they never really like officially get together, but they keep this, the show keeps trying to get them together, and they make it seem like they love each other a lot, or they really really care about each other a lot. But I have trouble. This is me personally. I have trouble buying that. Richard Dean Anderson as O'Neill. I don't think he's like an ugly dude or anything, but he just looks so much older to me than Amanda Tapping does. Amanda Tapping is a very pretty girl, and could have uh, just about any man she probably wants. And so it's hard for me to believe that she would choose Richard Dean Anderson. I mean, I'm not saying the guy's ugly or anything, but he's just got like an older, more, uh, I don't know. He's just got like an older commander look to him, uh, which I guess is why they casted him as the leader of the group as Jack O'Neill, which he does great. Um, there's scenes where they're together, though. They act really good, him and Amanda Tapping do, and you start to at least buy into the romance of them being together. But <clears throat> It just after them being on and off so much in the series, or not even really being on and off because they never really even actually start a relationship, at least not an official one. It doesn't seem that way anyway. Um, it just makes it harder and harder for me to buy it because a girl like that, I just I just get the feeling that she would just move on. I don't know. I just get that feeling. But anyway, as far as season seven goes, all the way, it is enjoyable. Um, skip on to season eight. Season 8, this is pretty much the uh, end of Stargate, or the regular Stargate with Jack O'Neill. Um, some people don't like the final of this season, with uh, them going back in time or whatever, <clears throat> which I enjoyed it. I thought it was good. I, I liked it, me personally. And it was nice to see uh, Amanda Tapping and uh, Michael Shanks playing like, a, I guess, nerdier versions of them of their regular characters in an alternate timeline, which I thought was funny. I enjoyed that episode, and at the main last episode, they kind of hint that uh, Amanda Tapping and uh, and uh, Richard Dean Anderson are going to get together finally, but in season 9, they don't even mention it, so, I mean, she comes to him at the end of it, and they're like hanging out together, and he's fishing, and it kind of seems like they're actually finally involved, truly involved with each other now, like they've owned up to their feelings, and then Michael Shanks and... Um, Christopher Judge show up and they're like all fishing and chatting and everything and then the, the episode ends. Um, <coughs> I enjoyed the episode. I, I thought it was good. And it's a two-parter, I believe. It's good. I enjoyed it. Okay. Uh, we jump into season nine here. The, um, no more Richard Dean Anderson. <laughs> He's pretty much only in one episode, I believe. And this... We bring in uh, the guy from Farscape. Which I like Farscape, but it's hard for me to remember this guy's name. Ben Browder, I think is his name. Uh, I enjoyed him in this, but when I, it took me a while to warm up to him, I'll admit I missed Richard Dean Anderson. I did. I missed him uh, and his chemistry. It wasn't the same without him because, first of all, I believe the character's name, the guy from Farscape plays, is Cameron Mitchell or whatever. He's all right. I mean, he's enjoyable. The actor does fine. He's enjoyable to watch, but um. It's just his presence, the way he plays his character and everything. He doesn't feel like a leader like O'Neill did. He just feels like part of the team. Like I'm saying, if you still had O'Neill in the show and this guy, this guy would just feel like part of O'Neill's team. He wouldn't feel like a leader. Um, it just, it's not that, it's not the same. Cameron Mitchell doesn't feel like a leader, no matter how good or bad the actor does, which he does fine. And I warmed up to him later on and really, actually started to really enjoy seeing him in the show. Um, but when he just even when I started to really enjoy seeing him in the the show, he still just did not feel like a leader. I mean, he just felt like he was a guy who just happened to be there with the team. That's what I'm saying. But he doesn't do bad, and he is enjoyable to watch, and he has fine chemistry with the other actors. But he's no Richard Dean Anderson. But still, some people try to say that seasons nine and ten aren't really Stargate. They are still pretty much Stargate. You got the O Rye or O Rye or whatever they're called. Um, coming in here, they're like the people that built the, the gate. They're ancient beings that built the, the actual Stargates. They're fine. I don't mind the looks of them, like the priors or whatever, the uh, prophets that work for them. These like, white-faced dudes walking around with robes and magic canes or whatever they are. <laughs> they're all right. You get Julian Sands playing like the main leader of the priors, I believe. <laughs> or um, And he's, he's fine. He looks actually creepy as hell. I wish they would have used him more. But maybe he's more expensive actor and they couldn't use him as much. I don't know. 
Um, but um, as far as it goes, they're an okay, they're an alright enemy. They are the weakest. I, I admit I like the replicators better than I do these guys. Um, <clears throat> but um, the problem with these guys is that we we run right into them, and the first thing that comes first is that they want to be gods as well, just like the Goa'uld or Gold or whatever they were called. It's been a, <laughs> I think that's how you pronounce the name. But um, they pretty much want to be gods too, just like them. And I'm like, well, this is just retread shit. But I guess what they were thinking is if we changed it and made them want to do something else, that it wouldn't really feel like Stargate because that's what all that's what the Gold or whatever wanted to do in Stargate was be gods or started to believe they were gods or pretty much believe in their own hype. So they probably figured if they changed it too much, it wouldn't feel the same. But jump into season ten, the final season here. Oh, as far as Boo Bridges goes. Uh, he is no General Hammond. That actor was much better. This guy, Bew Bridges, he is, he does fine acting wise. I mean, he's trying. He does all right. I mean, I don't hate him or anything. I enjoy seeing him. But uh, he's no, whoever, I forgot the actor's name was that played General Hammond, but he's no General Hammond. You just don't buy him as a military guy. Some, you, sometimes you buy him. I mean, I don't buy Bew Bridges in the military at all. I mean, sometimes you start to buy into him a little bit as a sort of a commanding figure, but you don't ever totally buy into him. But he has a decent likability about him as a character. And also his relationship with his daughter, like the girl from Jason X or whatever. Um, you just don't really give a shit about that, and that wasn't really needed. It goes pretty much nowhere. <clears throat> I mean, it's pretty much just a waste of time. Once again, Ben Browder is Cameron Mitchell. He's enjoyable, but he still doesn't feel like a leader. But he is enjoyable in the show and fun to watch. And, and, I, and I like the actor. I like Ben Browder. I like him in Farscape. I like him here, but he just doesn't feel like a leader. Um, he just feels like another member of the team. I mean, well, they should have made Amanda Tapping the leader. I don't know why Amanda Tapping, Samantha Carter, is not the leader of the team starting with season nine. I don't understand that at all. That is, she should have been the leader. I don't get that. But uh, as far as it goes for season 10, I do enjoy the final episode. It's not really the final of the series because we get two movies and they're pretty much the real final. But the final episode with, like, uh, I believe it's Credence playing, like, have you ever seen the rain when they're stuck in a time loop you know, on the board of one of their ships? That's that's cool. It was, a, it was a pretty good episode. Not great, but pretty good. Enjoyable enough. The Asgard's dying off, though, and leaving human beings all their technology. is like, what the fuck? Where'd that come from? But anyway... All in all, though, seasons nine and ten are both pretty good. They're not great, but they're pretty good, and they're they're enjoyable. If you like seasons one through eight, I'd say give nine and ten a try. They're not bad. Some some fans try to say they're horrible. They're not horrible. They're pretty good. They're not. They're just not great, but they're pretty good. Enjoyable enough. Just jump into the first movie, <clears throat> the Ark of Truth. This, um, I bought both movies. This and Continuum. Continuum is the better movie of the two. Just, I'll just go ahead and throw it out here too. Continuum is the better movie of the two. I enjoyed it more because Continuum feels like an actual movie and this feels like an extended episode. It really does just feel like an extended episode. Not bad, not a bad episode. I would give it uh, I would give it you know a thumbs up. It's uh, very enjoyable. I'd say four stars out of four, but it pretty much is an extended episode. Uh, because they're trying to completely cap off the uh, seasons 9 and 10, cap off the series, be done with it, so they can start fresh with whatever project they do next with the Stargate universe. Um, but yeah, you get Julian Sands back. Once again, I wish he could have done more, but what he did do when he was there, he was a creepy motherfucker and he was fine. Um, you get, oh, and uh, I forgot to, I think I forgot to mention Claudia Black right there. If you can see her. She's from Farscape as well. Um, I really enjoyed her in seasons 9 and 10. She was one of the highlights of 9 and 10. I thought she was pretty funny and a fun character. And I enjoy her here again in the Ark of Truth movie. I wish the girl that played her daughter uh, would have had more screen time or whatever. Where she's kind of like replaced the, the false gods or whatever. The ascended beings. And she's took over. I wish she would have had more screen time. But I think she had a scheduling conflict doing something else. I wish they kind of would have fleshed her out more in seasons 9 and 10. I think they could have did more of that character. Uh, and more of her relationship with Claudia Black. I think they kind of uh, fast-tracked it a little bit. You could have did more of that. Like had her kind of flip-flopping maybe back and forth between uh, the human side and the, the Orai or Orai or whatever side. 
he could have done more with that. But as far as this movie goes, I'll give it four stars. I found it very enjoyable. It was actually better than I thought it would be uh, from the first time seeing it. I enjoyed it. Oh, also, the, one of the things is they bring back the replicators in this movie, and I felt like the replicators again, what? But, uh, but I enjoyed seeing them. Shit, fuck it. They were entertaining. <laughs> Um, but they just kind of feel like something to keep the other characters busy. But they are entertaining. And nonetheless, like I said, it feels like an extended episode. For a direct-to-DVD movie, four stars. Enjoyable. Continue on. I like that they bring back Richard Dean Anderson's character. But he, he doesn't get enough to do. Once again, Richard Dean Anderson just kind of seems like he just doesn't want to be there, really. I mean, I don't know. He does fine acting-wise in the movie and everything. It's like he did in the TV series. But I don't know why he left the show. He was fine in the show. Maybe he just got tired of it. Maybe it was a personal thing. I don't know. But uh, whatever it was, I mean, I mean, if he was, if he just felt like his character had done enough on the show and he wanted to leave. That's fine. You know, whatever. But still, if he wanted to come back for the movie, I wish they would have let him do more. He should have got to do more. Should have done more. But as far as this movie goes, I would give it four stars. It's a, it's a better movie than the Ark of Truth. I still look, really like the Ark of Truth, but this movie feels like a real movie. It feels like an actual movie based off the show instead of just an extended episode. I mean, honestly, you could have just made the other movie, Ark of Truth, like a special and just broadcasted it uh, or just added it on to the television sets or whatever, the season sets of like season 10 as a bonus or something, or bonus episode as a special feature or something, really. But, um, as far as this goes, I really enjoy it. Pretty much, they go back in time in this in this movie, the continuum, and there's a ball. The last system lord has caused a uh, alternate timeline to happen, and they got to go take him out. He's the last like villain left over from the TV show, I guess, and they got to finish him off. Um, and uh, I like how at the end, it's pretty much Cameron Mitchell or whatever his character gets to meet like his own great grandfather. Uh, which was actually one of the guys who was transporting the uh, Stargate, which I thought that was kind of neat. I'd give this four stars as well. Uh, very enjoyable. Uh, it seems uh, <clears throat> good special effects, good action scenes. As far as it goes for any kind of weaknesses towards the show at all, uh, well, like seasons 9 and 10 without that, with the absence of Richard Dean Anderson, that, that hurts the show. Uh, not not completely, but it does hurt the show. Other things that hurt the show is that the show feels a bit derivative. The show doesn't really break any new ground, to so to speak, except for maybe like the whole aliens pretending to be gods things. They really delve into that a lot in the show, especially with the Goa'uld or whatever in the first like one through eight seasons, I think, or one through seven, maybe I don't remember. But um, they really um really delve into that a lot more than I've seen other sci-fi shows do. Or at least that I've seen personally. But they're really derivative of other sci-fi shows as well. Which doesn't make it bad. But it doesn't really break any new ground either. Like the whole show pretty much to me felt like Star Trek. With the whole exploring other planets and stuff like that. Which is not a bad thing. A show made in the spirit of Star Trek is not a bad thing. And it's like the replicators. They feel like when they start turning human or whatever into androids. They feel like a, a direct like rip off of the Terminators pretty much. I mean they make they can make like liquid metal weapons out of their hands and shit like the T one thousand from Terminator two. And I'm like, what? Even in the movie Arc of Truth one of the replicators like has a, a new ability that we never saw in the television series where it like starts controlling a human being like a puppet. I'm like, what? It's like the writers just pulled that one out of their asses. But anyway, it doesn't hurt the movie too bad because we get a decent fight scene between the human puppet replicator and uh, Cameron Mitchell's character. We get an enjoyable fight scene between the two. Um, but, um, and then, like, when the, the, the human puppet replicator guy gets, like, blowed up, the replicator, like, rises, has, like, the replicators in, are inside of his body have somehow, like, made a Terminator-type metal figure, and it, like, rises up out of the dude's body after he's been blowed up. It's just, like, the scene from the ending of the first Terminator movie, pretty much, um, where Schwarzenegger gets blowed up, and he rises up out of the body as a full cyborg, which I didn't knock any points off the movie for that, because that had to be a homage to Terminator 1, there's no way that they could have uh, not made that scene in there on purpose because it just feels so much like a redo of the scene from the ending of the first Terminator. There's just no way that's a coincidence. Or there's no way they did that without and, and thought that people wouldn't know that that's what that's from. But, um, yeah, but other than the derivativeness of the show, um, there's a couple of little cheesy episodes like when all the characters get on, get these like 
alien wristbands on their hands and they're able to give like they're able to do like superpowers and shit but they have like superpowers that's one of the other little weak spots about the show but other than that the show is very enjoyable the actors are all enjoyable they do great their plot lines are really fleshed out um the whole thing with the jaffa or whatever that tilk is a uh, um <laughs> tilk's a jaffa and he wants to free his people i mean all that stuff that's all great and um, very enjoyable to watch, and the actors all do fine. Um, I'd give the show four stars out of four. Very enjoyable show. Very enjoyable. I'm really glad I bought it. Um, I've, I was already into like sci-fi stuff, but after watching this whole show from episode one to the end, uh, it actually made me feel sad finishing it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, because I know like some of the actors have cameos in other shows, but it's just not the same. I kind of miss Stargate SG-1, but I do feel like it's ran its course, and it um, definitely got an ending with two movies, pretty much wrapped everything up. So as far as the show goes, I'd give it four stars out of four. Uh, I'd recommend buying the show because it's a show that actually has an ending. Uh, more often than not, you get TV shows that get canceled before they they get a final season or a final episode, but not here. <laughs> you get two movies that wrap up the series, so I'd say very enjoyable show. Well, again, very enjoyable. Four stars, highly recommended. To sci-fi fans, a bit derivative, but does enough new stuff and fun stuff with the derivativeness, derivativeness of the same old shit to make it still enjoyable to watch the same old shit again. <laughs> so as far as it goes, four stars, very enjoyable. And I will see you guys again with my next video.